Hello, how's it going? Today, we're talking about two things. First off, the Mantids, and then we're going to move on to the Mogu and see a bit of a conflict between the two. Sound good? Of course it does. Let's go! Below the roots of massive Kapari trees, the Mantids established an empire. They abandoned their battle with the trolls, as they knew they weren't going to win anyway. What would be the point? They still worship the old gods, believing one day they would rise from their prisons and retake the world. But the best way to serve them wouldn't be to play silly buggers, fight a war they couldn't win and expend their strength. It would be to conserve it, refine it, and sharpen it. There was an empress that ruled over the day-to-day -day activities, but ultimately it was another group that controlled the Mantids' destiny. They called themselves the Klaxi, which means priest in their stupid language. They guided the empress and the Mantid swarms in the hopes of preservation and strengthening of their race. Rather than focus on the trolls, the Klaxi chose a different enemy to target. The Mantids were drawn to the Veil of Eternal Bosoms because of Yasharjit's lingering presence emanating from the festering heart that Highkeeper Ra had locked away. Also in the Veil of Eternal Bosoms were the Mogu, who had been charged with protecting said vault. The Mantids launched a surprise attack on the Mogu, but the Titan Forged withstood and drove the Insectoids back. The Klaxi did not consider this defeat a failure, but rather a lesson. The Mantid soldiers had now matured and grown more powerful and cunning. They patiently waited a hundred years before assaulting the Mogu again. This rinse and repeat tactic was known as the Mantid Cycle. Every century, the young were sent to war with the Mogu. The ferocious battles removed the weak from the swarm, and only the strongest returned to the Kapari trees. Within only a few cycles, Mantid civilization had already gained considerable strength. The Mogu noticed this change, and they were a little bit concerned about it. So they decided to be proactive. They launched a campaign into Mantives itself to try and stop the cycle from coming again. They picked a good time for it too. The next lot of warriors were decades away from hatching, so the Mantids were few, and the Mogu were lots. They devastated the Mantid ranks. Even the survivors of past swarms fell. But one Mantid, named Corvin, emerged to turn the tide of battle. Armed with a blade forged from Kapari Amber, he single-handedly eviscerated the Mogu ranks, stopping their attack and sending them into retreat. So great were Corvin's skills that many Mantid believed he could cheat death itself. The Klaxi proclaimed Corvin a paragon and promised his deeds would become legend. However, Corvin wasn't satisfied. He knew that it was only by sheer luck that he'd arose in his race's greatest hour of need. The Klaxi agreed and tasked him with finding a solution. Corvin spent the next few years experimenting with Kapari sap. He discovered a number of things. It's very sticky is probably one of those things. But more importantly, he discovered that a living creature could be preserved within an amber cocoon, potentially for thousands of years. If they placed their greatest warriors in these cocoons, they could be awakened whenever needed to avert disaster. Corvin was the first to undergo this preservation and so, in honour of his deeds, the Klaxi named him Corvin the Prime. He would be the first of many paragons to come. As he lay undisturbed in his amber tomb, the cycle continued on for countless generations. So we're now 15,000 years before the Dark Portal and we're shifting the focus to the Mogu. The Mogu's faith that High Keeper Ra would one day return endured through century after century of hardships. But then the curse of flesh manifested and the Mogu kind of went, High Keeper Ra's a jerk. For the first time, the Mogu faced mortality, and they kind of felt a little bit annoyed by that. They were scared. They were uncertain. Small disagreements spiralled into conflict, violence and bloodshed. Packs of Mogu banded together, clans and warlords emerged by the score. Those who triumphed in brutal power struggles were quickly toppled by rivals. Everything went a bit wrong. This period of turmoil became known as the Age of a Hundred Kings, and the Mogu became very close to destroying themselves from within. However, at the beginning of each new Mantid cycle, the conflict within the Mogu would die down. The various clans would reluctantly unite and stand together against the Mantid. But once the cycle was over, the infighting returned. As the Mogu battled the Mantid and themselves, a number of other races arose in the region. Among these wondrous creatures, the Fish Heads, the Monkey Butts, and the Panda Jerks. The Fish Heads are actually called Jinyu, the Monkey Butts known as the Hosen, and Panda Jerks, which are by far the most intelligent of these newcomers, were the Wise Pandaren. The emergence of so much new life piqued the interests of four wild gods. And if you guess that these four wild gods are the ones that had really Chinese names, you guessed correctly. Well done, you. Zhuen the White Tiger, Yulon the Jade Serpent, Chiji the Red Crane, and Niu Thao the Black Ox all came to have a look at all the new fishy monkey panda babies. They gathered at the Vale to guide the new species, obviously a little bit troubled by what the pesky Mogu were doing, but they loved watching the other races flourish. The four wild gods developed a particularly close tie with the Pandaren. The Pandaren referred to the wild gods as August Celestials and viewed them as benevolent deities. They formed a system of worship devoted to the wild gods and in return, they received knowledge. At the behest of the August Celestials, the Pandaren formed a culture that sought peace and harmony with the environment. But we can't end on that. 
It's too nice. A new Mogu leader will soon arise and challenge the Pandaren's hippie culture. His name is Lei Shen, and not only is his rule going to threaten the mortal races of the Vale, but also the August Celestials as well. And we're leaving it there! So I guess the point of this video and the one from last Friday is to give you guys an idea of who's who and what's what and where's where. Moving forward, we'll definitely have some more character-based stories with people that have actual names and stuff. This Friday, for example, we'll be talking more about Lei Shen. So if you want to see that, click that subscribe button. If you enjoyed this video, leave a like. Also, you can talk to me in the comments. One thing I do like about this chapter is how it establishes the religious aspects of the new races. The fact that they're all worshipping the same gods, but in different ways. I find that interesting. But what about you guys? What story elements have interested you the most thus far? Let me know. But all that's left to say is, thanks very much for watching, and see ya!